So thank you very much for this invitation. It is indeed a big pleasure and an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about the work we have been doing. So let me just start. That should be. Okay. I would like to speak today about some different kinds of research we did on the honeybee brain and cognition in the bee brain in a way to introduce you the complexity you might have in what you would call a simple system. The question would be at the end, what does mean, simple mean in the case of this kind of neural architecture? So let me just start presenting the problem, the problem by showing you this general view of two brains. This is your brain, the human brain, uh, with his known volume and impressive uh, amount of neurons. And uh, this is a honeybee brain. Actually, this is a real 3D reconstruction based on conf called microscopy of the bee brain. And of course, they are not at the same scale as you realize immediately looking at the numbers. This is just one cubic millimeter, very tiny brain. And there is even less than one million neurons, 950,000 neurons you will find in this brain. So when you realize these huge differences in terms of volume, in terms of quantity of neurons, <clears throat> an immediate reflex might be to attribute or to assign to this brain quite reduced capacities or quite reduced cognitive uh, fits in this particular case. However, for the person like me who is interested in understanding learning, memory, and higher order processing in terms of cognition, these animals represent something like a gold mine. Because the whole biology, the whole survival of the individuals and the colony as a whole depends on their capacity to learn and memorize. And the fact is that honeybees are flower constant, which means this is something that was known since the time of Aristotle. Uh, that they actually remain working on the same flower species in the field as long as this species provides nectar and pollen, which is the reward they are looking for. So bees do not switch from one species to the other in the same tree. They work only on the same species as long as this species is rewarding. And we know, of course, now that the reason for keeping constant on the same species is the fact that they learn and memorize the sensory attributes of the species exploited. They learn, for instance, uh, the, the colors, they learn the odors, they learn the shape of the flowers they are uh, exploiting, they learn the spatial position in space and so on to return constantly to the same patch of flowers. Um, so this flower constancy uh, is actually, by the way, what explains that you might have some particular honeys of sunflower, of lavender, and so on, because they work in chains, something like that. So, uh, and we know that this capacity is actually uh, based on the capacity to learn on and, and memorize the sensory attributes of flowers they are exploiting at a given time. The other reason to work with these animals, actually, is the fact that they are experimentally accessible, meaning by that that you can train them. You can train them to fly into the lab, for instance, to work on specific setups to answer the question you have. You might ask questions about olfactory capacities, visual capacities, length of memory, and so on, and the animal will answer with the particular behavior provided to the problem you're posing. Uh, they are extremely cooperative, meaning by that, that as long as you're able to provide the tiny drop of sugar water which replaces the nectar they are looking for, they will be doing hundreds of flies between the hive and the lab just to answer your question. You have to be there, provide the reward, and the animal will work for you and answer your questions. Um, the other point, and this is where the advantage, or the, actually the disadvantage may, may become an advantage, is that they have, and I put it in quote, simple brains, as I told you, just 950,000 neurons. And yet, they learn, memorize, and they incorporate, or they acquire an impressive amount of information to achieve their foraging task. So this is where you might perhaps guess that it's Probable, in, in terms of probability, it might be easier to find specific circuits underlying these tasks just among 950,000 neurons compared to 100 billions of neurons. This is just a statistical guess, of course. 
Uh, and the other reason to work with bees is that, of course, you might use different insects to study in, uh, or invertebrates to study simple forms of learning and memory. And invertebrates have, have been extremely influential to understand the neural and molecular basis of learning and memory. Think about Aplesia, think about Drosophila, and so on. But these guys have a unique feature that Drosophila, for instance, the fruit fly, doesn't have that not only they learn simple forms of learning, meaning by that these other associate with reward or the other other associate with punishment, very basic elementary uh, links between stimuli in the animal's environment, but they are also able to learn higher order forms of learning, which other insects so far uh, cannot show. Um, and let me tell you what I mean by that. So. Um, this is just a, a couple of experiments I would like to show you to introduce the problem and the complexity of the system. We will speak about a way to study honeybee behavior. This is one way we will see other ways later, which is to use free-flying bees under controlled laboratory conditions. So these are animals that have been trained to fly from the hive into the lab to solve particular problems. So um, how do you do that? It's very simple, actually. You uh, my uh, put a petri dish with sugar solution at the entrance of the hive, wait that the bees discover the solution, and when they are drinking the solution, you move progressively the dish towards the lab. And the animals might progressively learn the path to go into the lab and go for the food they are looking for. And then you can train progressively the animals to go into setups, mazes, and so on. And they will do, as I told you, hundreds of flights per day to get this uh, sugar reward they're looking for. And what I would like to tell you today is some form of higher order problem solving that we showed some time ago in bees, which is addressing the problem of relational concepts. So what are relational concepts? Because it's a matter of definition. The one that I would like to use today is uh, to learn relationships encoded independently of the physical nature of the objects linked by the relationship. So we might learn relationships or solve problems based on relationships irrespectively of the objects linked by the relationship. For instance, we might know that the solution to a problem may be always knowing that you have to choose the larger object or the one which is above the other, and so on. So as I say, it's not important to have a red object below a blue one, it's not the color. It's not important to have particular shape of an object uh, above the other. What counts is the specific relationship that you are learning. So, um, well, we learn these particular relationships, which implies, people say, some kind of level of abstraction because you might get rid of the sensory information of the objects to focus on the relationship binding them. And uh, the question we had some time ago was to uh, ask whether bees could also learn this particular form of relationship. And uh, I'm showing you just one example here, which is the principle of the rule of sameness. The rule of sameness is typically studied in vertebrates, primates, and so on, um, using a protocol called the delay matching to sample problem. Uh, in a delay matching to sample problem, what you do is you have a subject and you show one object, for instance, this laser pointer. And uh, after that, for instance, I mean, there is no reward, it's just showing what you call the sample. And after that, you might show, for instance, the same object against another one. Let's say these two objects. <laughs> Sorry, these two objects. And the animal has to choose one, not knowing what is the rule guiding to reward. But the one choice will be correct and the other not. In this case, what you have to realize is that choosing what has been shown to you before, irrespectively of what has been shown to you, is the rule guiding to reward. So objects might change all the time, but if you learn that the sameness rule is the one guiding to reward, which is choose what has been shown to you before, then you get the reward. So we did this uh, problem uh, in the case of bees, and the way we, we addressed the problem was to, to train them to fly into a Y maze from the hive, and the Y maze is in the lab, of course, and they arrive here, and there is the yellow disc at the entrance of the, of the maze. Uh, there is no reward there, there is just a yellow disc and a hole in the middle. So when the bees enter uh, 
uh, into the maze, they see two alternatives, a yellow one and a blue one. Because the rule is the rule of sameness, they have to go to the yellow, land on the yellow, and then they get the drop of sugar reward. If they go to the blue, of course, this is a wrong choice. They get punished, they get expelled from the maze, they have to go all the way back, and so on. So three minutes later, they might be back. And then, surprisingly, there is no yellow at the entrance, but blue, the one that has been previously punished eventually. And in this case, of course, because the rule is a rule of sameness, you have to enter the maze and then go to blue, because the rule is choose what is shown to you. And in this case, the animal get reward. Of course, this experiment is done taking care of, of not having the reward always on the right or on the left. So the, the side of reward is, is randomized and so on. So the animals might learn then, then if it's yellow, then go to yellow. If it's blue, then go to blue and so on. But even if they learn that, this is not enough to show that there is a rule, a kind of abstract rule guiding their behavior. You need to put the animals in a very novel situation in which they would show you what they have say, in quotes, in mind. And so this is what we did. When we saw that they were mastering more or less this double problem, they came back and they found this situation, which is a fully novel situation, not colors, no colors in this particular case, achromatic, black and white patterns, vertical or horizontal. You have basically two outcomes in this situation. Either the animals are totally disoriented because they never seen this and they start flying around without knowing what to do, or they use a rule. And if they use a rule, they wouldn't care about seeing this for the first time. They would uh, see the vertical pattern here, go into the maze and choose the vertical, or they would see the horizontal, go into the maze and uh, choose the horizontal. In the same experiment, we had another group of bees trained with the patterns and tested with the colors. So you have the two ways. So this is what we got. This is the training of the animals. You have two curves, one of animals trained with colors, this one, which is blue, blue, yellow, yellow, and so on, and another one for animals trained with the patterns, vertical, vertical, horizontal, horizontal. These are blocks of 10 visits to the mains, which means 60 times the bee flying back and forth between the, the lab and, and, uh, and the hive, which is one day of work, approximately. And you see that at the end of the day, these guys are quite good in their respective problems. Seven to 75% uh, of correct choices is not bad for a bee, I would say. But now comes the critical moment, which is the moment in which you present to these guys the novel situation, which is here. So when the bees train with the colors arrive at the maze at this stage, and so for the first time, the vertical patterns, they enter the maze immediately and chose the vertical. When they saw the horizontal, the same happened. They entered the maze and chose the horizontal. This is percentage of choices, but if I would show you the first choice, it would be the same. Uh, in the same way, uh, the animals train with the patterns, which arrive at the maze and see for the first time the colors. When they see the blue, they go for blue. And when they see the yellow, they go for yellow. So this experiment was interesting because it showed that these animals can extract from the training situation, uh, the rule of sameness, independently of the physical nature of the stimuli trend. You can see the transfer between chromatic and achromatic patterns. I'm not showing it here because there is no time for that. But in this experiment, or in this kind of experiment, we can even show transfer between colors uh, and others, showing that is not based on the sensory modality. Okay. Uh, additionally, also no time for that, but we could also show that they can extract the opposite rule if trained to do so, which means choose the opposite to what is shown to you. And they can also solve the problem based on learning this difference rule uh, that can be also trained. Um, well, these were very f uh, so first experiments we did in this direction, and since then, of course, we have been addressing the problem of conceptual learning. And there have been many, many experiments done by our group showing that they can extract many different rules. Rules, I mean by that, using the principle that you change the stimuli, confront the animal to novel situation, and nevertheless, they transfer the rule to novel situation as long as the relationship uh, that was trained is there. For instance, uh, they even master two rules simultaneously, like this experiment done by my co-worker Aurora Vargas, uh, who trained the bees to learn that the relationship was 
choose the stimulus in, in which you have two objects or two images, one above the other, and on top of that, the images have to be different from each other. So she showed by different experiments that the animals were extracting the two uh, uh, notions in this, in this experiment, the spatial relationship, one above the other, and the notion of the two images have to be different too. Uh, so, and, and let me just show you a very recent experiment by Aurore, by the way, and by Scarlett Howard, the postdoc in my group, which, which might show you, again, the level of complexity that you might reach in this system. Uh, this, uh, Scarlett and, 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 and Aurore were interested by the sense of numerosity you might find in bees. And they ask a question about the possibility of having a concept of zero in bees. So, and um, of course, there might be different definitions of what zero might mean, and of course they have different levels of complexity depending on how do you define. You might have zero as nothing, which is just the absence of a stimulus. Uh, you might address zero as nothing versus something, which is another way to see it. Uh, or you might understand zero as a quantity at the low end of a positive integral numerical continuum. Uh, at the end, you might argue that uh, in the most advanced way of representing zero is the symbolic representation of zero with an Arabic number and use in modern mathematics and calculations and so on. And of course, you would not expect this one in bees for obvious reasons. But what about the others? Um, let me tell you, just remind you that there have been some experiments uh, about pirates, so one gray pirate showing something like that, something like the existence of a sense of zero being none, or something like none. Uh, and so what uh, Scarlett did uh, is to train bees using the Y maze in a similar way as I showed you before. But now the animals, there is nothing at the entrance. There is just the fact that they have to enter the maze and choose images which represent quantities, like here, for instance, two or three. The animals uh, can be trained in two different ways, two different groups, of course, of animals. They can be trained to less than, and another group can be trained to choose greater than, which means that, for instance, in here, two versus three, if you are a less than B, you have to choose two. In the next situation, you might have two versus one, then you have to choose one, because you are trained always to choose the lower number. Uh, the other animals are trained to choose greater than. In this case, they would have to go to three, which is greater than two, and so on. The point is that the stimuli are changing all the time. The numbers change all the time, uh, and also the images. They are not always made of squares and so on. So uh, like these, for instance, these are some of the stimuli that were used in these experiments. Uh, one, uh, two, three, four, five, and you can see they are made of circles, square, diamonds, and so on, and they are also changing the spatial position to avoid matching uh, with, with some particular point of space, and so on. So let me show you one brief result here, and this is, for instance, a training uh, done with, with uh, the animals, and, and let's imagine these guys are trained to less than. For instance, if this is, in this case, they would go to one versus four. In this case, they would go to two versus three because only in this case they get the reward. In this case, they would go to two versus uh, uh, four and so on. So then uh, to just verify that they learn, you present a novel situation because these were done with diamonds and square, then you present circles, and you verify that they choose the uh, number three against the number four because this is what have, they have been trained to. And now comes a conflict test. What would happen in this particular case when they would choose zero versus nothing, or uh, if you want to extrapolate to higher numbers, five, which was never used here, versus two. And this is the result. So if we look at the less group, which is interesting one here, the guys trained to less than, uh, you can see uh, that, of course, they choose always to 75% three versus, for instance, four in the novel situation. But when they were tested with zero versus three, and this they see for the first time, they prefer zero versus three. There are other tests I don't have time to show you where you can also show zero versus one, they prefer zero, and so on. So uh, these, with these and many other experiments that you can find in this work, uh, the, the argument is that these animals uh, choose an empty set stimulus, like this one, um, containing no elements if they were trained to less than. 
Uh, and um, by doing these experiments, zero versus one, zero versus two, zero versus three, zero versus four, and showing that the larger the differences, the better the performance of the animal, uh, the argument is that they would understand that the zero lies at the lower end of a numerical continuum, of course, a continuum that might be reduced, but, but nevertheless, that might be there uh, to some point. So these experiments are uh, interesting because they as I say, show the complexity of the problem. And when some people ask me, why don't you work with Drosophila? Which, by the way, we do. We have Drosophila in the group, and we use Drosophila for other questions using the neurogenetic tools that Drosophila offers. But not for these questions, because, of course, so far, the only young insect, so far, of course, that is able mm -hmm. to solve this kind of problem is the honeybee. So, but these experiments are frustrating for the behavioral neurobiologists like me. They are frustrating because they reveal very, very exciting capacities, cognitive capacities, but you have no cue about the neural circuitry behind that. Why? Because you're using free-flying bees, bees that are flying free between the hive and the lab, and you need to do that because this is the way the animals might exhibit the full richness of the behavior and then reveal what they can do to you. But on the other hand, you cannot open the head and access the brain to record of an animal that is flying between the hive and the lab. So, I mean, at least so far, this is not possible. So we need other protocols, we need other questions, uh, probably not the same, to be able to access some particular neural mechanisms of higher order forms of learning in the bee. Uh, so, um, we need other protocols and uh, to study associative learning in bees in the laboratory and the critical fact is the animals should not move because you need immobility to be able to record from neurons, to access neural signals and so on. And, um, and that's a challenge because you need to have an animal that not, doesn't move, but nevertheless that shows you that it learns. And not only that it learns, but it might also learn, say, a higher order problem. And so let me show you a possible way to do it. There are control condition protocols with harness bees, bees that are immobilized. Uh, several of them, several modalities. I'm just showing you one, the most famous one, which is used by our group and many other groups, which is the so-called olfactory conditioning of the proboscis extension reflex. People call it the PR, which is proboscis extension reflex, which is a case of Pavlovian learning. So the proboscis of a bee is the tongue. So bees have a proboscis, and there is an innate reflex, something that is inborn, which is the fact that when you have a hungry bee and you touch the antennae with a droop of sugar, this reflex takes place. Boom, the tongue goes out. It's like hitting your knee with a with a hammer and then you do that, tack, the same. So this is something inborn. You have a hungry bee, which is immobilized here. You see this is a metal tube, and the bee has been harnessed here. You put it into the tube here, and there is just a head protruding from the tube. This is the head of the bee. And this is an apparatus, an olfactometer, which is sending to the animal head a constant uh, clean, uh, uh, airflow of clean, uh, clean airflow in which you might introduce a pulse of odorant uh, controlled by a computer, which opens valves of odor cartridge, and then you send the uh, pulse of odor to the animal. The idea is actually to create, as I said, a case of Pavlovian learning, an odor that does not mean anything to the bee will be followed by sugar solution. And by doing that, it's like Pavlov's dog, you have the bell and the meat, well here you have the odor and the sugar, and the, the animal should learn the association between odor and sugar, um, and then, if this is true, the animal should later extend the proboscis, the tongue, to the odor itself, because, because odor would mean food. That's the idea. So, uh, well, this is, again, the apparatus. This is, again, the animal. Oh, this is a, a, a primitive way to deliver the sugar, which is just you have a toothpick soaked in sucrose solution. You might go and touch the antennae to release the reflex, and then you allow the bee to lick the sucrose solution. And, uh, of course, you can do it to, if you want to control the reward with micro pipettes and so on. But this is enough for, for the sake of this experiment. And, um, and this is the way it works. So here you see... 
a movie in which you have a harness bee, so this is a harness, the animal cannot move, and you will see in this movie a red square showing the moment in which the other, which you don't see, of course, arrives to the animal. And, um, okay, that's, the animal is alive, it uh, spends some hours there, so it's hungry, and uh, then the other will arrive and there's no particular reaction, and now comes the sugar. And you see immediately the proboscis extension reflex, and you see the animal is motivated once more, it sees. And in this particular case, uh, you expect the animal to have created this association between uh, the other as a conditioned stimulus and sucrose reward as an unconditioned stimulus using the Pavlovian terminology. And uh, the fact that this is the case is shown here because now you just deliver the other in the absence of sugar and you will see the learning uh, represented by the proposed extension reflex to the other in the absence of sugar. So this is a very convenient preparation because the animal shows the learning uh, in a, a immobilized situation, as you can see here, which allows you to, to access the brain of the animal. So it is very, very fast because if you represent the percentage of proposed extension reflex of a population of bees, let's say 100 bees, to the other, uh, and you saw just one trial in the movie, you will see typically these kind of learning curves. They are amazingly fast. If you consider that trials are separated by 10 minutes, for instance, you will see that after trial number two, after two other sugar experiences, almost all the bees are learned, and they might reach 90% of, of, of uh, successful learning in almost all, uh, all of the cases. And if you call the order train the order A, just to call it in one way, and you put a plus here to say, okay, this is the order that has been rewarded, and you put your bees in an incubator in order to avoid losing them in the hive among thousands of guys, uh, and you keep them in the darkness and feed them regularly during their entire life, which is two weeks, and you then two weeks later bring them back to the lab, place them in the same setup, and you ask them, hey, do you remember which was the order that was trained two weeks before, A, B, or C? Typically, the answers you get are like this, okay? So uh, showing an amazing, robust memory, and this is why these animals are used as a uh, surprisingly good model for understanding several principles of memory formation, molecular cascades, and so on. So uh, the advantage is here, that uh, the external surface of the body of the bee uh, has a very, it's a kind of armory made of a substance called kitting. So uh, you can uh, open a window actually uh, in this uh, uh, structure, in this uh, material, and then you can expose the brain and the animal will not be, in quotes, harmed because it will be showing the behavior lively and you can then record simultaneously while the animal shows the reflex, learn, memorize, and so on. So then you can try to understand how this uh, learning uh, works here in terms of circuitry, neurons, and so on. So, um, well, because not all of you might be familiar with the, um, the bee brain, let me show you how this works. So we have olfactory receptors at the level of the antennae. In the case of the bee, we have approximately 60,000 olfactory receptors. Uh, and at this level, they might be, of course, stimulated by the appropriate molecules, and then they would send the message towards the brain by an olfactory nerve. And uh, the first processing center is called the antenna lobe. We will not be speaking about that today. It's made of glomeruli, somehow like the olfactory bulb of vertebrates. And uh, you have neurons quitting or leaving this structure, bringing the olfactory message to higher order centers like the lateral protocerebrum, which you might, or lateral horn, which you have here, is a kind of diffuse structure. And uh, to these huge uh, structures you have here, which are called the mushroom bodies. The mushroom bodies are interesting because they are not just olfactory. Uh, they receive information from the visual areas, from gustatory areas, from mechanosensory areas, and so on. So they are higher order centers, and they have been historically associated with the storage uh, and retrieval of long-term olfactory memories. When I say memories, I'm speaking about what you have seen in the movie. So very simple association, one order means sugar, that's it. Okay, uh, so 
uh, well, this is again one hemisphere. If you would just look at this hemisphere, you would see this. This is the so-called antenal lobe, this region. The uh, projection neurons leaving this structure going to the lateral horn or to the mushroom bodies that you can see here. We were talking about these structures that you can see here. They are called mushroom bodies, by the way, due to the peculiar form, uh, which reminds some mushrooms in, in, in a way. Uh, so let me, let me focus on this structure now for, for the rest of the talk, which is, um, as I told you, these are very huge structures in the bee brain. In the case of the bee, they represent approximately 30% of the whole brain. They have a calyx, which is the input region where you have all the arrival of different sensory informations. You have a pedunculus, like here, which is the output region of the mushroom bodies. And uh, not only they have been associated with memory storage, memory retrieval, but uh, they have been also associated with other processes like attention, uh, like, yes, selective attention and so on, which might be useful for the kinds of problems we are talking about today. So, um, so these are the mushroom bodies, for instance, and just to be more clear, what you have see uh, here is the separation between three regions uh, in the input region. These are the calyces, and this part, for instance, receives olfactory information coming from the antenna lobes. This part, the cola, receives visual information. This part might receive somehow visual information, but also mechanoseptic so mechanosensory, and here gustatory information, and so on. So you have these segregated uh, input regions in the mushroom body, but the neurons that leave the structure are multimodal, most of them. So showing that there is some kind of integration of the level of these mushroom bodies. Uh, so, but the question I like to show here at the end is whether the mushroom bodies are just for long-term simple memories, or if they can do something more. And uh, I would like to focus on uh, something that we call nonlinear problem solving that has been studied also in many vertebrates. Uh, so, nonlinear problem solving is to study nonlinear, so called nonlinear discriminations, and it goes like that. So, it's a basic problem actually. If you think that uh, stimulus A, every time you see stimulus A, it brings you 100 euros, and then every time you see stimulus B, it brings you something euro. What is your prediction when you get both, actually? What do you expect to get? 200 euros. Well, 300, <laughs> that's too much. You, you are an uh, optimistic, Laurent. <laughs> you would expect basically to have 200 euros because you simply do a summation of the situation, which is what I call the linear processing, the summation, actually. But in this kind of nonlinear discriminations, what we want is the animals to inhibit somehow this linear processing and to learn that any time you see both of them, they won't be 200 euros. They won't be, there will be nothing, actually. They, the animal has to go against this, say, automatic linear processing. And uh, the way you do it uh, in, the, in the case of, of um, a bee is to use a protocol that is called the negative patterning. We did with our, our friend Harald Lachmit at the University of Marburg. And uh, we use this protocol in which a subject is trained with a random succession of three situations. Every time there is a stimulus A, there is reward. When there is B, there is reward, say the 100 euros. But every time you show both of them, there is no reward. So the animals have to learn that despite the prediction that A, B has to be twice as good as A or B, no, that's not the case. A, B is bad because there is nothing on it. This is the so-called negative patterning problem. And this is a, considered a hard problem because if you just focus on A or B as a way to solve the problem, there, you have an ambiguous situation because A is as often rewarded as non-rewarded. A plus, A minus, same for B, B plus, B minus. So if you just rely on the value of the single element, you will be lost because you will know what to do. Uh, how do you do that in the case of a bee? So you would train uh, the animal to using one order that is rewarded, uh, another order that is rewarded. You would show two apparatus to the animal to present simultaneously the two orders converging to the animal's uh, head, showing both of them, and at this time, there would be, of course, no reward, and you expect the animals that during blank trials there is no reaction. So that's what you would expect. So you would train the animal in such a way that it learns that A, B is not the sum of A plus B, the nonlinear discrimination. 
Uh, and before you tell me that, okay, but this is trivial because AB might be in the brain a new entity C and then the problem is trivial, uh, of course we, we took care of that and we chose a, a couple of orders that we knew for sure uh, trigger this kind of linear solving. Here you have, for instance, the typical case, you train them to this simultaneous presentation of two orders. This is not the negative patterning problem. This is just training the two orders at the same time with reward. You see that they learn it very well, and then you ask, uh, did you learn? Yes, I learned. This is my response to both of them. And if I give you just one of them, you can see, yes, I recognize that in the compound there is A and there is B. So I see both orders in the compound. So A, B is not C, is not something different. I see that there is A and that there is B in this compound, and you can see the summation effect that makes the response to A, B larger than either A or B. Okay, so we use these orders knowing that normally, in normal conditions, they treat this compound of two orders as being the sum of A plus B. And then we went to the brain, we looked at the antenna lobe, and we did some calcium imaging experiments to verify that in the brain this principle was maintained. So uh, we were recording the response of these neural populations, and particularly we look at projection neurons, the neurons leaving these structures and going to the mushroom bodies. And this is typically, for instance, what you have if you encode, you see the, the response uh, of this region to one order. So you would see, for instance, uh, one, two, three units, these units called glomeruli, responding to the order. So each order is represented in terms of specific pattern of glomerular activation. And the orders chosen, for instance, as here, this is the pattern elicited by this order, this is the pattern elicited by this order, and this is the pattern elicited by presenting both together. And look at this. If I just take these two, okay, and I make an arithmetic sum pixel by pixel of these two images, I get this, which is practically the same between what you have in the real term, showing again the summation effect. So um, what we did here is to block the mushroom bodies. The idea was to generate bees that might be like patients having lesions, reversal lesions in the mushroom body. So this was done by Jean-Marc, who established the principle of being able to inject procaine in the mushroom bodies, in two mushroom bodies, in order to silence them. He knew, based on uh, um, lots of, of, of experiments, that, uh, that he was blocking voltage gate, sodium and potassium currents in reversible ways. He knows the time of the effect and, and so on. So he might have bees with silence mushroom bodies during a specific time window. And then, of course, the question would be, can you solve a negative patterning problem, a complex problem, in the absence of mushroom bodies, yes or no? And at the same time, can you solve a simple problem, on the other hand, in the absence of mushroom bodies? So the way you do it, this is again the advantage of using these guys. If you look well, this animal has been operated already, because you can see a line here, because the window, uh, cover, uh, the, the, the surface covering the brain has been cut and just replaced. And now when the moment of the experiment comes, you take it out and you inject your animal into the mushroom bodies, like here, okay? So, well, if you are close to, to the screen, you might see that the mushroom bodies are here, and then you might go uh, and then inject, for instance, uh, the blocker into the mushroom bodies, you use specific uh, dyes to know that the substance remains in that place and doesn't diffuse to other places, and so on, so that you know that your effect is specific. You can do also other controls injecting in non-mushroom body areas to see that uh, the effect is specific to the mushroom bodies and so on. So and you can see, by the way, the spots here of inject. And then you replace the cover, and the animal is ready to go. So, and now, of course, you uh, will see the, the answer to the problem. This is what happens with animals injected with saline solution, control animals. So you can see, and that's already something interesting per se, that the bees were able to learn the negative pattern in discrimination. So they learned to inhibit this linear processing. Remember that the others used were per se, or uh, at the origin, treat as being the sum, or the compound being the sum of the elements. And here you see that they learn to inhibit this treatment. So at the end they uh, keep responding to A alone rewarded and B alone rewarded, and they inhibited the response to A, B when these two orders are presented together, which is already a kind of exciting result per se. 
Uh, now what I will do is just to show you, to simplify my graphs, just the last point of the performance to avoid showing you lots of curves. So if I show you these, um, this is what you get. So the animals injected with saline solution are here. This is the level that you have here when you have A or B pulled together or when you have AB. You see, they learn the problem. What happened with the animals which had the mushroom bodies blocked by procaine? As you can see, these animals were not able to solve the discrimination. So uh, you might argue then that mushroom bodies might be necessary to this, say, nonlinear problem solving. Yet, uh, you need a control experiment to show that this is the case, uh, that this is not a phenomenon due to the procaine injection or something like that. So what uh, we did is uh, to train the animals to a problem that looks like the negative patterning, but that it's not complex. Look, the animals were trained with A rewarded, B rewarded, and two different other CD non rewarded. This is a very simple problem here because any order has a unique value. Here, A is always good, B is always good, C is always bad, and D is always bad contrary to the previous problem where you had the ambiguity at the level of the element. So this is a very simple problem for the bees because there is no ambiguity. And you can see obviously that saline injected animals learn it very easily and even better than before. Uh, in the case of the negative pattern, they respond to A plus and B plus and they do not respond practically at all to the CD minus. What happened with the bees which had no functional mushroom bodies at the time of the experiment? They also learn it. Okay, you can see that uh, they learn to respond to A, B, and not to C, D, which they could not do in the case of the complex nonlinear problem called the negative pattern. So uh, this experiment was interesting because it, uh, the, the take-home message is that, uh, first of all, you might have some forms of simple learning, elemental learning, uh, non-ambiguous learning like this one that may take place outside the mushroom bodies, in all the previous structures, my argue the antenna lobes or plasticity uh, existing at the level of the antenna lobe might be enough to provide an answer to this problem. But the, the typical message or the interesting message is to know that these structures might be absolutely necessary to acquire, not just to retrieve memories, to store memories, but to acquire, because injections are done before the training, to acquire nonlinear discriminations. So just let me finish to show you this experiment. This is a lateral view of the mushroom body. So these are the different segregated input regions. This is the output region view from the side. This is a model here showing the olfactory entrance, visual, mechanosensory, gustatory, and so on. This is the output region. And if I'm showing you these, it's because we focus on a particular population of neurons leaving the mushroom bodies. Um, there were two types of GABAergic inhibitory feedback neurons leaving these structures, the so-called A3V neurons, which uh, actually, this is the first draw when they were first described. These guys leave actually the, 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 uh, the output region and go back to the input region, providing GABAergic inhibitory feedback. And the other population leaves the output region and go back to the output region. So you have essentially from the output back to the input region and from the, which is one here, this is a modern uh, image of the, one of these neurons, this is the somata, then you take the information here and go back to the input region, here you see the neuron in particular, one of the neurons I'm talking about, and you have the another population which leaves the output region and goes back to the output region. So these are GABAergic neurons, and what uh, Jean-Marc did is to do a very precise localized injections uh, of picrotoxin to inhibit the GABAergic signaling either here at this level or at this level. So, uh, well, the question is which kind of neural population would be necessary to solve the problem? And uh, because the idea would be that these GABAergic neurons might be necessary to keep down or to avoid the summation and keep down the level of responses when you have uh, this, this simultaneous presentation of A and B. So uh, he injected, and he of course did the negative patterning, he injected either in the input region or in the output region to address these two groups of neurons. And you can see that when he inject in the lobes addressing the output to output population, the animals are still able to solve the problem. They were not impaired necessarily by this. But when he injected 
in the calyces, the input region, addressing the population going back from the output and deliver the GABA to the input, then the animals could not solve the problem anymore. So uh, this would call or speak for a role of these AV3 neurons providing this GABAergic inhibition at the level of the calyces uh, as a fundamental component for solving this problem. So what we show in this experiment is we move from the free-flying free bees experiments to a problem in which the animals do not move, in which nevertheless you can train them with others and can address problems like nonlinear discriminations. And we show that uh, the animals cannot solve these problems in the absence of functional motion bodies. Remember, however, that they could solve simple versions of that. So, uh, and um, the, the lesson would be that these structures are not only required for storage of memories, retrieval of memories, but they might be also required for solving non-elemental complex learning tasks. And their role might be also to disambiguate information, like having A, B being different from A plus B, and generate adaptive response in non-linear problems. That might remind you, to some of you that are familiar with this literature, to what has been suggested to structures like the hippocampus for the same uh, problem solving, because there have been experiments of negative patterning and lesions at the level of the hippocampus and the necessity of this structure for solving these particular forms of problems. Of course, I am not saying that the mushroom bodies is the hippocampus of the bee. That would be a kind of simplification that should not be allowed. But in terms of analogies, I mean, you might argue that there might be structures also in the bee brain that might be used for particular forms of learning and others that might be required for simple forms of learning. So, and, and well, uh, in these particular experiments, we argue that this gaba thick uh, signal in this population of neurons provides a cue or, or helps decreasing responses to the non-relevant stimuli. So, oh, this is, I want to show you this because this was done last week, and, and this is very exciting to me. Yeah, just this, this is the last image. Uh, because we wanted to address the same problem in the visual modality, so cre we create a virtual reality system for the bees, and the animal is uh, walking stationary on this uh, uh, treadmill, and there is a screen showing images in front of it, so you can create an animal immersed in something like, that would be something like virtual reality, and uh, so it works like this. Uh, that was work by my student Alexis Buatois. And uh, well, the animal is there. And then, of course, you might uh, actually uh, train the animal, say, to particular stimuli. The animal is moving the stimulus. It's not us. The animal is walking and either uh, bringing the stimulus in front of it or making it far away and so on, uh, because everything is coupled to the own, uh, animal's movement. And uh, so we did the same experiment, A, B, A, B, and we showed exactly the same problem. So the animals learned to respond to these and to these, and they inhibit the response to the joint presentation, which in other conditions they would not do. And so what we are doing now is to trying to record uh, from uh, different populations of neurons to understand what would be the neural signature of this problem solved. So the general conclusions of this talk because time is short. Uh, what I try to do today is to show you some kind of selected uh, choice of, of experiments, uh, showing you that uh, it makes sense to, to try to analyze some basic forms of cognitive processing using this model system. So I show you that the bee brain consists of a network of specific neurons. Well, we spoke about populations like AB3, AB4, and so on, but also uh, identifiable particular structures like mushroom bodies and others that, that we can address. And this brain architecture might produce, of course, stereotype behavior. Of course, you have inborn behavior. Think about the proposed extension reflex, for instance, but also plastic behavior that goes beyond simple forms of learning. Okay? It's not just simple, this order means sugar. There is much more than that. Uh, so this brain is neither primitive, it's not rudimentary, I would say. They are not just associative machines. Uh, as I say at the beginning, it's a simple brain, in quotes, uh, because there is a reduced number of neurons, but not in terms of sophistication or performance. We have seen uh, conceptual learning, we have seen nonlinear problem solving, and these are just two examples of many others that we address in the group. And the advantage, or what we try to do, this is our bet, of course, is that we can retrace some of these problem solving to specific circuits and brain structures in the, in the bee brain. Uh, 
Um, okay, so the take home message would be that this brain is not just a perceptual, simple machine. It categorizes information. Well, there are lots of experiments we have done on categorization by itself. Uh, it extracts or disentangles, organizes knowledge, whatever knowledge would mean for, for B, but in, in a way that it can be used uh, later in an adaptive way in novel situations, like, for instance, in the transfer test that I showed. So perhaps the best way to, to finish this talk is to mention this very famous scientist you might all know, Santiago Ramón y Cajal. And Santiago Ramón y Cajal, of course, a uh, uh, Nobel Prize in uh, 1906 uh, and, and fundamental contribution of the concept of neurons, uh, he was a, an absolute fan of insects. When you visit the Ramón y Cajal Institute in Madrid, uh, if you're lucky enough, they would show you all the preparations he had and hundreds of thousands of preparations of insect brains. And he wrote this book, which has been recently re-edited in Spanish, Contribution to the Knowledge of the Insect Nervous System. And I took a sentence from here, I translated, which is the perfect final quote for this talk. He said, insects possess a nervous system that is incredibly complex and differentiated and whose sophistication attains ultra-microscopic levels. Certainly, he said, the gray substance of the brain of vertebrates has increased considerably in mass but when one compares its structure with that of the brain of apidae, he means bees, or libellolidae, he means dragonflies, it looks as excessively coarse and rudimentary. It is like pretending to match the rough merit of a standing wall clock, big, huge clock, grandfather clock, with that of a pocket watch, a marvel of delicacy and precision. This might have been the equivalent of Eiffel in his time. Uh, essentially, the genius of life shines more in the construction of smaller than larger masterpieces. Thank you, and these are the guys who deserve the credit for the permanent